Hello everyone, my name is Zenaida serrano Arvman, and I'm the Public Information Officer with the Communications Department at the University of Hawaii West Oahu. Thank you for joining us for a Q&A with UH West Oahu regarding the reopening of our campus for fall 2020. The semester starts August 24th. Nationwide, colleges and universities are navigating how to reopen their campuses. Here at UH West Oahu, we are taking a holistic approach. Our focus is the health and wellness of our campus, Ohana. Let's start with UH West Oahu Chancellor Maynette Benham. Chancellor, when you realized the pandemic would be prolonged into the summer and beyond, what steps did you take? So mahalo Z for uh, taking the time to uh, interview uh, myself and the team this morning. Um, I, I will admit that uh, I had been watching the COVID outbreak uh, globally prior to April. In fact, on March the, the 12th, we had to shut down the campus. It was just as we were entering our spring break and we needed to make decisions about what to do given that COVID had reached the shores of Hawaii. And I do recall at that time, the, many of the, the officers for the UH system and, and chancellors were, were discussing whether or not we had to close our campus down, uh, if we were gonna put all of our classes online, uh, what we were gonna do. It was a decision at that point that we would pivot uh, during the spring break and put all of our classes online and close down our campus. Um, we thought at the time that we would actually be reopening and we would have graduation ceremonies on our campus uh, in May. We did not anticipate that this, that COVID-19 would be something we would, 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 you know, define a, a, a new normal uh, for all of us. So in April, when we began to understand that COVID was with us for the long haul, uh, we began to really take a look at some of the challenges that we were facing. Besides closing the campus, there were a number of costs involved. Uh, we had to redo graduation, our communication. Uh, we had to get messages out there because it was a very ambiguous time. We knew that people were feeling fearful and, and uncomfortable with the situation. Um, so there were a, a number number of uh, work groups that we put together. Uh, our team, our emergency team came together um, and we began to, to really take a look at, at what we needed to do um, moving forward. Can you describe the challenges you faced and how you prepared for them? Yes, um, and that's why I've invited uh, the, the real workers, the real worker bees of our campus uh, to be on the Zoom call with us because, you know, um, I use uh, an olelo no eau to best describe the work that we've been doing here on campus. And I recently used it in one of my, my bulletins and it's aohe hananui ke alu ia. Basically, that means that no task is too big when done together by all. And uh, the challenges, I have to say, could not have been met without the expertise and the commitment and the skill set of all the people on this Zoom call and the folks that they work with them. But I will say that operationally, there were a lot of stuff we had to do. And you can talk with uh, folks on the Zoom call about how we went about closing the buildings and cleaning them and whatnot. At the same time, because we put everything online, um, you know, Dr. Gloria Niles, Therese Nakadomari, all of the people around IT and education, uh, our Vice Chancellor, our Associate Vice Chancellor of Academics, everyone had to get involved because it was a whole new teaching um, platform for some of our faculty and many of our students. Um, at the same time, we had to really take a look at cleaning and we had to take a look at, at different ways of, of communicating and, and moving Moving people to more remote areas, so I, I would I would like our um, our staff to to answer that question, Z. So should I ask? Um, let's ask. Uh, let's ask Gloria and our Vice Chancellor of Academics and Associate Vice Chancellor of, of Academics to talk about what we had to do because we had to put everybody online. 
You know, I'll be happy to start. I'm Jeff Moniz, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. I'm the Chief Academic Officer uh, for the campus. And um, as Maynette was mentioning, it was a real team approach. And so I'm glad that she uh, called upon Associate Vice Chancellor Alan Rosenfeld and our Director of Distance Learning, Gloria Niles, to um, also add to this response. But we took a real team approach. And uh, the other person who was uh, very instrumental is our scheduler, because we were having to move the, the big task of moving a lot of our courses uh, online or into a hybrid modality. So, um, you know, we only ended up with, I think, three purely face-to-face -face classes remaining. Everything else is, uh, has been moved uh, totally online um, or into some kind of uh, hybrid modality. And it took a lot of hard work. I know, uh, for example, um, we worked on, on uh, coming up with the criteria for how we will decide what classes get to be, uh, have a face-to-face -face, uh, component. Uh, and and uh, a lot of work went into, um, uh, you know, Gloria uh, described the different kinds of modalities that we would uh, make available to our faculty. So that kind of, that, that kind of work, um, they'll, they'll describe it a little bit more. But one thing that we also wanted to do was we realized we didn't want to just toss out the entire uh, schedule for the fall as it was already uh, created. So we worked within the structures of the old schedule, the 80 minute blocks, and came up with a, a way to uh, stagger um, online present, I mean, face-to-face uh, -face presence on campus uh, in a way that would um, reduce passing time of people on uh, in the halls uh, and also shorten the time period, so there's a, a shorter duration that people would be sitting in a classroom together. And so, um, uh, they could, uh, I, the, Alan would be able to talk a little bit about uh, the social distancing uh, measures that we uh, worked on and, and had to establish earlier on uh, as we were making these plans. But it was a real um, a team effort that not only involved um, uh, different offices in uh, academic affairs, but across um, the campus as well. Alan, um, would you add to that? Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Rosenfeld. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. And the first thing I would point out is that there is no handbook for how to operate a higher educational institution in the midst of a pandemic. Not today, and certainly not in March when this started. In many ways, that initial transition of sort of chaos and just moving the entire curriculum online, full stop, coming out of spring break was easier than what we're planning for in the fall. Because now we're looking at opening up the campus in a modified responsible social distanced format in the fall to hold some classes with in-person elements on campus. So as of today, we're looking at a fall um, class inventory that's 73% fully online, about 26% in hybrid online formats with some degree of in-class component, and only about 1% that are in a traditional face-to-face -face format. So one thing that we've found is that now more than ever, communication is key. We really have to work across all the departments, all the units of the campus, and not only within academic affairs, to offer any of these classes with in-person components. We cannot merely say, I'm going to teach history 231 and throw it up on the schedule, because now we need to have, for example, close coordination with our information technology department to make sure that we have the, the, the capacity to project and record classes so that students can zoom in and attend from off campus. We have to coordinate with our facilities team as well to make sure that our custodians can clean and sanitize the classrooms effectively. That means coordinating with our scheduler to make sure that we have appropriate time in between classes to allow for that cleaning to take place. We have to coordinate more closely than ever with our student affairs office as well because they're answering questions from students who are wondering what these classes are going to look like. Is it going to be safe for me to attend in person? What, they're wavering as to whether they, even they want to come back to campus or not in the fall. 
So it's really trying to break down those silos and bring people to have these collaborative conversations. Um, and that's what we're engaged in right now. So I can turn it over to our Director of Distance Education, Gloria Niles. Aloha, I'm Gloria Niles, the Director of Distance Education. And to build on what Vice Chancellor Moniz and Associate Vice Chancellor Rosenfeld have said, uh, as we created the hybrid classes, we had to take into account the fact that each classroom could now only hold about 25% of the capacity that it typically would hold. So a classroom that typically would seat 40 students can only seat about 10 students, uh, given the desks uh, being spaced six feet apart. So there were a number of factors that we had to consider of uh, being able to provide effective instruction, uh, given the social distancing guidelines, uh, because as uh, Associate Vice Chancellor Rosenfeld mentioned, uh, that we are going to have to have students participating both online and in person at the same time, given the limited number of seats in the class. Uh, so uh, we wanted to make sure that classrooms had uh, large monitors where the students that are participating online will be visible in the classroom and can be active participants in the classroom. We had to make sure that the faculty were prepared that they will also have to maintain a safe distance from the students. Uh, and so they would have to remain in a teaching zone, as we call it, that will be taped off in the front of the room. Many of our faculty really like that active engagement and interaction and walking around the classroom. And so making sure that they realize that that's part of what's gonna have to change in the in-person environment. Uh, students can't be grouped together because they have to stay at their desks six feet apart. And you have to have opportunities to engage students who are online and in person at the same time. So we compiled uh, lots of resources to, uh, to assist faculty that we've placed on our La Lima site uh, of how do you uh, develop your pedagogy so that you can teach effectively with students who are in person and online. And then we also had to take into consideration uh, different ways that we would determine who is going to be uh, in person and who's going to be online. So we created two different uh, versions. One we call, uh, we refer to hot hybrid, meaning here or there. And the, the hot hybrid could either have rotating groups, meaning that uh, there are two groups of students or three groups of students in a class and there are certain scheduled dates that they attend in person and dates that they attend online and then uh, there's also a reserved seating group which gives a little more agency to the student the student there's a sign up system and the student would then determine uh, which days that they're available to attend in person and which days they would attend online by reserving a seat, kind of like our new movie theaters where you reserve a specific seat in the theater. Our students would be reserving a seat in the in-person class on a particular day. Uh, so lots of those factors that we took into consideration uh, for these new ways of teaching both in-person and online at the same time. Thank you, Gloria. Um, so going back to the initial challenges, I was wondering if maybe um, we can hear from um, IT and communications about what those were. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit about that. Hi, I'm Therese Nakatomari. I'm the IT director for West, UH West Oahu. Um, in the early days, we had a challenge of getting equipment out to the faculty and the staff. Um, we had to predict what people had um, we had prepared in early, uh, late February to purchase a lot of web cameras and headsets so that we, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we could uh, make sure that our faculty could teach distance um, effectively. Um, we already had some software that could do lecture capturing um, and we just had to distribute that. Uh, we did purchase a lot of Zoom licenses, and I think we gave out 125 licenses during that time frame. And 
you know, uh, kudos to the faculty for learning on their own how to get on Zoom and um, use it for their classes. Um, we did loan out um, roughly about 10 laptops out to students who um, contacted us about um, not having equipment that and we did have a few students come in to use our computer lab during the um, spring shutdown. Thank you, Therese. I was wondering if Loke could speak to how our students, um, you know, how they were severely impacted um, and how we addressed that. Aloha, I'm Loke Lani Kenolio, Director of uh, Enrollment Services. Uh, good to see all of you. So yes, our students were pretty severely impacted. That transition was hard, not only for our faculty and staff, it was extremely hard for the students as well. Um, our priority was safety first. So we made sure we got students, they were safe, that they were able to care for their families first and really tried to provide that support there. Um, that was a big teamwork effort with faculty and staff, the whole everyone. The second though challenge was really that transition to online. And two things were really highlighted in that spring semester. It was actually having the tools, the actual like computer, Wi-Fi, um, access to hotspots. We realized that was a need, but the other need was the skill to learn online well. Like having that ability to be able to do these multiple forms of online learning. So we really tried to help support them get through the semester um, with multiple means. Therese shared how we lent out computers, laptops. Um, we worked with our providers to get make sure they were had access to the free Wi-Fi. Um, so that was another success tool that helped students. In terms of the learning and online, we ended up having all of our student affairs team, all 40 staff call students, give a personal call, do a check-in, how are you doing with your safety? How can we support you? And we also then provided support through our NOEL uh, Center for Learning um, with the tutors on like, how do I do this online? We did these mini workshops of how do I do Zoom? Um, especially for the students who had to make that quick transition from face to face to online. So really providing the tools, skills um, in a quick version but allow them to feel supported and get them through the end of the semester. Thank you, Loke. I was wondering if maybe Nancy with HR can address the quite similar question regarding how um, we supported employees during this time. Uh, thank you. This is Nancy Nakasoni, HR Director for UHS Oahu. Um, we had a very short turnaround to implement a telework uh, work from home plan. Uh, supervisors and employees uh, develop, um, identify duties and responsibilities and essential functions that could be done from home and to ensure that um, maintaining essential services to ensure success for all of our students. So, you know, they develop various plans, some stayed home 100%, some stayed home maybe one or two days, some, and we have a, a, a whole bunch of employees that weren't able to um, stay home, but they continue to work every day. So um, they did that in a very, very short time, thinking that it was going to be for a short period and not uh, realizing that we would be doing this. Um, this is going into our fourth month, but we've been very successful and um, with, with what we've been doing. Thank you, Nancy. Um, before we move on to the next question, maybe communications can also address some of the early challenges. Sure. Hey, everybody. Leila Shimokawa, the Director of Communications at UH West Oahu. Um, I think I want to reiterate what Associate Vice Chancellor Rosenfeld was saying about communications. And it was uh, truly a team effort. And all of the people on this call and beyond around the campus were really in a collaborative spirit. So I think that helped communications do what they needed to do to, um, to push out the information to our students, faculty, and staff. I think the hardest part 
early on was that the information was coming so fast and it kept changing almost every single day. And so we wanted to be really consistent with, with what we were saying. We wanted to align with what our UH system was, um, was pushing out as well as the state and federal authorities. And so it, it, it felt like um, we were just running to catch up. Um, but once decisions were made and we were able to fine tune those plans and really, really um, provide some, some concrete information, I think that's when um, people started to feel a little bit more comfortable with what we were doing. You know, in, in early July, late June, we pushed out our guidelines. And so people started to understand that there was so much work being done behind the scenes that maybe they weren't uh, informed about. But now it's, it's like, okay, the campus does have a plan. and We are implementing those plans. Uh, Chancellor Benham stood up all these task groups who were just scrambling behind the scenes. A lot of the, um, everybody on this call was participating in some form in one of those task groups. And so there was just so much work being done behind the scenes. And uh, as far as communications, we, we were happy to, to be able to, to um, um, help to allay some fears going out. And, and in terms of what Loke was saying about working with the students, you know, I think um, what we wanted to make sure the students were students knew is that we are working really hard on making sure the campus is safe and healthy so when that students return to campus we have procedures in place that will that will um help them going forward thank you leila i was wondering if um, anyone on the panel can address the issues regarding facilities uh, regarding ppes yeah, thank you for asking that question, Z. I see Bev Arillo, who's online, and Therese online as well, that can respond. I do want to say that this is being recorded on, on Friday, and our facilities people, including Kevin Oshida, Yoshida, who is our Vice Chancellor of Administration, are right now on campus preparing our campus for Hurricane Douglas, and that's why they're not on the Zoom. But I will say that um, because uh, in March, we moved everybody off campus, working remotely, students online, very few people, the density on campus was very low. It really did give us a window of opportunity to start to clean the classrooms and, and to learn about what was happening in other places around the world that helped us to determine how we were going to approach our campus. Unfortunately, Bonnie Arakawa isn't on the call and neither is John Murakami. Both have been integral in uh, the ways in which we are cleaning our campus, uh, setting up our cleaning stations, rearranging our rooms, as well as purchasing the PPE. But I'm going to talk to Bev because Bev has been working with them and Therese is a really good example of what we did because she had to prep a computer lab uh, this summer uh, in order to accommodate those students who did not have access to computers or uh, internet service. So Bev? Aloha, Beverly Orello, Environmental Health and Safety Office uh, for UH West Oahu. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been really uh, challenging in getting supplies, as in uh, wipes and um, hand sanitizers, just like everyone else is experiencing right now. Um, a lot of places uh, we are uh, competing with first responders. Uh, you've got the hospitals, general public's all getting the same thing. Uh, what really helped us is a lot of resources. Uh, we've checked with our other counterparts um, at the other campuses, reached out to a whole bunch of uh, different resources to get our supplies, but rest assured we do have wipes, we do have disinfectants. Uh, our custodials have been trained and talked about this whole situation where uh, there, it's it's going to be a lot of cleaning of high touch areas, uh, so there's a, a lot of things that um, has been implemented. Uh, plexiglasses uh, had to be purchased uh, so that people that are going to be working with the public uh, that they're protected. We needed to make sure that uh, our classrooms are all set for the six feet distancing. Um, this is also including the laboratories. We had to find the safe areas for our laboratories because students 
are going to be coming into the laboratories to for the instructions. So we want to make sure that they're protected as well. Um, we've also I've also talked with a lot of the science instructors uh, to make sure that our students that are going to be in the laboratories that they are uh, protected uh, while they're doing the experiment, not just from the experiment itself, but also because of the pandemic that we're going through. Um, so a lot of challenges, but just as everyone's been saying, we've been working all together from our team here and as well as our counterparts on the other campuses. And I just want to interject that we have a lot of signage now on campus that explains to students, uh, you know, what they're responsible for and faculty, employees, staff, uh, you know, you go up the stairs one way, you go down the stairs another way. There's a limit of people going on elevators. Uh, same with the bathroom, same in the library. So there's a, a good deal of signage around campus to help us keep the physical distance um, that's required, as well as reminders to wear your facial covering, um, washing your hands, and, and all those other things. Uh, Therese, sorry. Um, yeah, so setting up the computer lab was um, a huge challenge for us on top of um, taking care of the faculty first and then taking care of all the staff that needed to work from home. My help desk students I, were amazing. They got the room set up and social distanced within a day and they made sure that all the computers because on our campus, our computers have different software for different courses. Um, we had at least one or two of them brought up to the A227 lab. Um, they were quickly trained on the cleaning protocols and we opened up the next week and they took care of the students that came over to use the lab and um, the Wi-Fi. Um, a lot, we had a lot of students come in needing a place to study and use the Wi-Fi because they said there was a lot of distractions at their homes. So uh, we were very happy to have people come in and utilize the lab. Thank you, Therese. Thank you everyone for addressing that question. We're going to go ahead and move on. Um, UH West Oahu received approximately 2.4 million in financial support from the federal government through the CARES Act. How did we use this funding? The, I'm going to just uh, briefly overview it, but then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Loke and Sherry to talk a little bit more about the CARES Act. There are really three tranches uh, to the CARES Act. The first tranche went directly to students. Uh, the second tranche was monies that we had to use to address immediately uh, the impact of COVID on our campus uh, by supporting faculty, staff, students. Uh, a lot of it was just cleaning our campus and preparing our campus supplies and equipment. And the third tranche that Sherry can explain a little bit more as well is a little bit more flexible. Um, and uh, it, it's to help us to get through uh, this academic year. So I'll, if I can, I'd like to turn it over to Loke and, and to uh, Sherry. Mahalo. Um, I'll, I'll start off with how we use that first batch of money, which was for the students. And the good news is, is that we were able to provide all of our spring students or most of our spring students, over nearly a thousand of them, a check uh, of support of about $700. So that was really good news for many of our students. What we found was when we made those phone calls out to students to do our check-in, one of the number one concerns was finances. So we were very thankful that we were able to get these funds to provide these to students. The second batch of funds so that we did have for students, we were able to support our summer session students with a small check, about $150. But again, this is to help support and alleviate some of that financial concerns as students and families deal with the COVID crisis. Sherry? Hi everyone, I'm Sherry Ching, a fiscal manager here at UH West Oahu. As Chancellor Benham had mentioned, you know, our campus was very fortunate to get um, basically three tranches of CARES funds. 
And as Loki mentioned, the first about $700,000 went directly to students. The second tranche was, was another 700,000. This was to be used for institutional costs. So costs directly related to this, the pandemic. And so a majority of these costs, you know, they were, I mean, the, the funds were used for the costs that well, Therese mentioned as far as IT equipment, and as Bev mentioned, PPE, sanitizing uh, materials and whatnot. And because we are a minority serving institution, we got we qualified luckily for a third tranche of funds and that was about $1.2 million. And because as Chancellor Brennan mentioned that it is um, a bit more uh, flexible in its usage, we are using it you know, as strategically as possible to continue our operations due to their budgetary upcoming budgetary constraints um, this fiscal year. Thank you, Sherry. So the fall semester opens on August 24th, which to this day is exactly a month away. Can we talk about the process if there is a positive case on campus, which is a possibility? Maybe that's, um, this is a question for Dr. Young or um, Stacy Kelly, a registered nurse. Um, as far as the process within the campus, um, I would let Stacy speak to that. And then perhaps when she's done, I can fill in what some of the behind the scenes with Department of Health would be if we have a positive case. So Stacy. Oh, hi. Um, actually, let's start with Nancy because that's where we're going we're channeling everything through Nancy, so maybe we can start there. Okay, so effective um, July 6th of this uh, month, we started the HR, the, the COVID hotline, and um, calls are coming in to the, would come into the HR office uh, to report any um, COVID symptoms, which would be the fever, cough, uh, runny nose, or you know whatever cold symptoms in addition to if they got tested, if they were exposed, a family member was exposed or whatever situation. So we have that set up um, and ready to go. And whenever we, if we get whatever information that we get, we do share with the um, COVID direct, the directors. Um, and we have a team that is looking at each um action that comes in and then we we have an action plan set up um, to address each situation chancellor did you want to address this question as well oh before uh stacy and and susan uh talk yes we do have a, a, a uh west oahu covid response team uh the co-leads are chris nevis and nancy nakasoni and we do have a process set up to intake uh information from our our employees and our students uh one way as uh, nancy had uh, raised is through our hotline uh it, there's a phone number and you can access that online um maybe at some point z or leila you could provide us with that number. Um, we do also have an email address that people could email us as well. And Chris checks that email uh, regularly. Um, and so the information will come in, uh, both Chris and Nancy, along with uh, Dr. Susan Young and Stacy Kelly, who is our registered nurse, are those people who really take a look at that data to make a decision of what we need to do. Um, that is, uh, um, I, I think most of the campuses currently have a COVID response team. I will also say that we are going to be instituting a health app uh, that the UH system is putting together, which should go live for all people who come to our campus, employees, students, as well as visitors. Uh, that help app we're hoping to, to go live in mid-August. Our campus is fortunate that we're gonna have a chance to pilot it in uh, several days uh, to see how it works and to work out the bug. So there's a variety of ways that we're gonna get information to help maximize the health and well-being of everybody on this 
campus. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Stacy and Susan to talk about what happens if, in case that we do have a positive case on campus. I, I, I do know that Stacy is the one who who, who uh, connects with the Department of Health, and um, Susan has been. Um, uh, trained in contact tracing and, and actually understands more about the, the back end of the process. Um, so after Nancy, go, uh, you know, asks questions um, or the student contacts the hotline, if they've already been exposed or they have a positive test, of course, we encourage them and tell them, you know, to stay put. Uh, to self-isolate or whatever they need to do as far as their symptoms, as far as see seeking medical attention or, you know, whatever warrants um, at that point. Um, we want to totally discourage any, any students that are feeling ill or even questionably ill um, to stay home. Um, that being said, um, if they were to get sick on campus or, you know, start to feel ill, we, we want to limit them from moving about the campus. And all of us, of course, are, are exposed to all the, um, the, the media and all the information about those things. And you, know, you just wanna stop in your tracks and not move around. Um, if the student does present though, then you know, we'll do a quick check, try to get them to a health provider as soon as possible and isolate all, all the places that they had um, been on campus. I don't foresee that this is gonna be a huge problem. Um, hopefully people won't just you know, instantly become sick. Usually you wake up and you feel sort of icky. Uh, so you know, people won't come to campus, but um, should that happen, um, we have a, a variety of questions and um, we'll be going through some um, a health assessment and whatnot. Um, we prefer that the private physician does that, but I am available to do any of those screenings. Um, also, like I said, we do wanna keep them isolated and definitely they need to have a mask on um, as, as, as do all of us. Um, if they become, um, if the questions um, warrant, um, any involvement with DOH, we, of course, I will do that um, immediately. And I'm also talking to Susan. And Susan um, is very well versed in all of this as far as the, um, the tracing. And she was mentioning in one of our meetings, if someone's already testing, uh, the DO, DOH is going to know before we know. So I'm going to turn it over to her right now. Thank you, Stacy. Hi, I'm Susan Young. I am a registered nurse and also associate professor here at UH West Oahu in health administration. As we can see, it takes a full village to bring all of this information together and have it go out in a nice streamlined format so that everyone is informed, students, faculty, our administrators, and students often will have many questions. Well, what does this mean? What does that mean? Because they're getting bits and pieces from the media. So part of our goal is also to make sure that we've educated everyone um, appropriately and with the newest information. Because we know with COVID, some things have changed in the last couple of months. But as Stacy was saying, um, I have gone through contact tracer training through Johns Hopkins and through UH and Department of Health here in Hawaii. And it's true, the perfect world will be that our Department of Health has been notified the minute there is a positive case. And they will get that information either from a lab or from a physician's office. So there's a couple of different areas they may get the information. Um, once that information is given to Department of Health, they will call whoever is positive and they will determine how many contacts they may have. Then that information is given to a contact tracer. That person is very important for the fact that 
Remember, we know now that some folks are asymptomatic. They may have signs and symptoms and not even realize it and may not realize that they have to go into quarantine because they were exposed. So I'll be working very closely with Stacy and our whole team to provide that information to make sure that we are indeed reaching everyone and giving that education um, that's needed. Many students may have a question, well, what if that contact tracer calls me? How do I know that's who they are? Why are they asking me for my name and my birth date? And so we have things in place so that they will know what to ask, what to expect when they get that phone call. But most of all, don't be scared that Department of Health is calling to help you stay safe and keep your family safe. Thank you, Susan. So what will, and this is for everyone, um, what will UH West Oahu look like come August 24? Anyone would like to take a guess? <laughs> I think it'll be absolutely fabulous. We are going to um, have a, a, a smaller density of people on campus, given um, that the majority of our classes, uh, about 75, 74% of our classes will be online. The rest will be in some sort of hybrid format. And so the density will be smaller. Uh, we will have, um, it will be nice actually to see a lot of faces come back and uh, to welcome them. We will be physically distanced. Um, and so you're gonna have to throw the shaka sign or elbows from high fives from far away. Everyone will be wearing face masks of, or facial coverings or shields um, to, to help not only protect themselves, but their colleagues and their peers. Uh, the campus will be filled with a lot of signage to remind you to check in on the health app or uh, check in on the web survey. Um, anyone wanna say what a classroom would look like or what student, what student experience might look like? Hi, if I could chime in, I just want to say that I, I want our campus to be a happy place and to be a safe place, a place of refuge for our students. Even students studying fully online, we cannot just take it for granted that they have the computer access, the internet access, or the quiet work environment at home to succeed. And we want to make sure they feel welcomed and safe to come to campus and study, attending classes or in the library or another space on campus in a socially distanced and responsible manner but we wanna welcome them and we hope that they have a positive experience. Um, for the fall, every classroom will have self-sufficient self um, Zoom capabilities um, so that the faculty can use any modality they, that they choose. Um, each room has enough technology where they could broadcast their classes synchronously or we are currently setting up two studios that they could broadcast or record their classes um, so that they can offer it asynchronously. So we're trying to meet all the needs. Um, as things pop up, we will be ready to meet that challenge. And, and I can share from the student services lens that we're, we're going to be open and ready, focusing on safety, but focusing on students' experience too. We know that it's going to be still very much a virtual type experience. So student orientation, um, student life activities, tutoring, a lot of our services, whether it's getting a transcript or seeing an advisor, will continue to be more of a virtual option for students to access safely, but still get the answers and support they need. Um, we will have services open for a face-to-face, -face, but maybe limited. There will be working now through a plexiglass, um, face shields and face masks, but we will have the services ready, open and ready to go. 
before Z gets to the next question, I just want people to know that our library will be open. There'll be limited hours for the library. The first floor will be open and many services will be available as well. Okay, before I move on, did anyone else wanna to add to that? Um, I just wanted to add uh, for the classrooms, uh, for the students, there's gonna be hand sanitizers in the classroom for them to use. There's gonna be wipes for them to use in the uh, classrooms as well if they want to uh, wipe their desks. Uh, the desk seating is gonna be six feet apart. Uh, you'll see a lot of blue tape on the floor of the classrooms. Um, it's kinda as a guide for the instructors as this is a safe spot uh, for you. You're six feet away from the very uh, closest student. Um, so you'll, you'll see that in the classrooms. Um, uh, in the libraries and other public areas, there's also hand sanitizers for everyone to be using. So you'll see a lot of that uh, on campus. I'd like to chime in. I just want, I think that the campus will be filled with people who are hopefully embracing our Pueo safety promise. So that's a pledge that we are going to be um, pushing out to our campus community that talks about, um, you know, being accountable to yourselves and, and each other to keep each other safe and healthy. And so that includes things like staying home if you're symptomatic, if you're showing a temperature over 100.4 degrees, submitting to the uh, health app or web survey prior to coming into campus every day. And again, we talked about that earlier with the, um, the process that will go to the response committee. Um, wearing a face covering, a face shield, some, uh, any type of thing that's gonna be protecting, again, um, others around you. Keeping informed about, about the latest updates, um, as Dr. Young was saying, you know, it's, it's about understanding the situation, the current situation, and, and being, in, um, being informed through our, what our state and our federal authorities are telling us. And finally, being kind and compassionate caring for the well-being of our campus community. I think it's really important that we all know that we're in this together and that we're all here supporting each other in any way that we can. Thank you, Layla. Okay, next question. Um, across the state, we are dealing with budget crises. What considerations has UH West Oahu made? So before I punt this to our budget and finance people who are on the, uh, on the line, I know this is something that many of our campus employees are, are very interested in. And I just want to let everyone know that we have been attending to this throughout the summer. Um, and as we get closer to convocation, which will be held on August the 19th. Uh, we hope to have more information about this topic. But to give you an idea of how we are address what we're looking at um, and, and uh, how we are uh, analyzing it right now, I want to turn it over to our budget and finance uh, folks, Linda Psyche and Sherry Ching. Hi, I'm Linda Psyche, budget director at West Oahu. Um, we've been working really hard over the summer and towards the end of the spring semester trying to figure out what kind of allocations are we looking at. Um, basically, we have two pots of funds. One is the general funds from the state, and that's very unpredictable at this moment, not knowing what our state revenue um, will look like. In addition, we also have to juggle what our enrollment will look like um, it's over the summer semester as well as into the fall semester. But I assure you, we've been working hard. It's been all hands on deck. Um, we've been trying to get it down to a very lean budget, but I'm confident that our campus will be able to provide the same level of high expectations that we have um, given our lean situation, but we'll do fine. We'll be okay. Yes, um, I agree with Linda. It, it, we've been working very hard um, together to, you know, work on um, and managing our fiscal constraints or upcoming anticipated, I should say, uh, fiscal constraints. Um, there, you know, we've been trying to be very cautious. Um, you know, really looking and scrutinizing, I guess, all costs, you know, to make sure that we are prioritizing um, our costs appropriately. Um, 
and we have done some, you know, basically right now, if it's institutional cost, everything has to be approved by both the vice chancellor, the respective vice chancellor and the chancellor. Um, so we are trying to make the best and most appropriate decisions as we move forward. Thank you. I do want to say uh, both uh, Sherry and Linda have done uh, extraordinary in terms of providing us with guidance. Uh, us, I should say, the, the vice chancellors and myself, but also John Stanley and Christy Pollicott from our institutional research office, who has also been providing us with the kind of information we need to run a variety of different scenarios. I don't, you know, I know we're getting towards the end, Z, and I don't want this to end on a, on a low note. So I know you do have a couple of questions that will bring us right back up again. Uh, but I, I, I want people to understand that this is extremely lean times and I, I want to publicly thank our vice chancellors uh, for their ability to really take a look at their operational budgets and cut anywhere up to 50% of what they would normally uh, expend during uh, a fiscal year uh, to, to help us to make it through uh, to thrive in this year and at least for the next two to three years to come. Again, more information to come. So thank you, Z, for asking that question. Now move us on to something a little bit more upbeat. <laughs> okay, well, I have just a couple more questions. Um, the last one is, is a little more you know, positive, but we do need to touch on a little bit our enrollment. Um, uh, what have we done to address falling enrollment due to the pan pandemic? And I was wondering if maybe um, Loki can address this. And the last question, I promise, will not be so loaded, will be very positive. Um, actually, no, the enrollment I can share is um, like everyone else, that has been our number one summer focus. We actually pulled together our, a recruitment hui of about 24 faculty staff to come together to relook our enrollment efforts that we already had in place, but really to key in on how COVID has affected the change in how people view the college experience and if they're able to do that. And so we came out with a list of efforts and um, with the help of many faculty, staff, we have really put out to four target groups, right? Our first year, those recent high school graduates to our transfer students. We've done efforts for our continuing students. Um, we're very excited that we can continue all those efforts, things from personal um, phone calls to outreach to very low cost uh, budget type items such as postcards. Um, we've done lots of, we do using lots of social media to get the word out about we're here, we're ready to help you, let us help you register for classes. Um, so we are really putting out all the efforts to to get the enrollment um, up and at a good place. I can share that as of today, every day we look at our enrollment numbers at the start of summer, we were at a, we were very worried. We were at a negative 20% of enrollment compared to that time last year. But as of today, we're just down 3.5%. Um, our goal is to be at the same count of students that we had last fall. So we're about 320 students away from that goal, but we're really going to push hard with everyone's efforts um, to get that last group of students. Thank you, Loki. Okay, so last question. What are your biggest takeaways from this experience? I, I think it harkens back to uh, what Chancellor started with, and that's the importance of taking a team approach. And, uh, and some of the things that other folks on this panel um, have mentioned about um, the importance of communication. Um, I think about the validating the thoughts and ideas of our staff and faculty as we work together on, on troubleshooting uh, um, issues and just making sure that we recognize um, the value of those efforts. So it really, I, I feel like the biggest takeaway has been um, 
that value, that importance of uh, a team approach. Did anyone else want to add to that? I'll, I'll let anyone else uh, say lessons learned before I conclude. Anyone else? Therese? I second what um, Jeff said that our campus is amazingly collaborative and we work together really well. Well, there are some bumps, but really well overall to get a task done. Um, I've heard from other campuses and they didn't fare so well during the spring changeover and I think we did it very effectively and with minimal um, loss I guess and um, for my department it was the Boy Scout model of be prepared um, if I didn't do a huge order of headsets and whatnot in February we would not be prepared for um, this this um, shutdown. So um, kudos to everybody here and all of our staff because I think we we did really well getting through it. I'll just say real quickly, we are not in this alone. This is a global crisis, and we should count our blessings and be thankful that we're in a position where we can help and support others. Mm -hmm. rather than being in a position when we are in dire straits and need assistance. Mm -hmm. So let's all pull together and make this happen. Loki, did you want to say something? No, I just was saying my biggest takeaway is not only the collaboration, it's just our resilience and our willingness to push through. It, it's been a tough several months, but together, um, we were able to really work through some of the hard pieces. And, um, and I appreciate that people who have strengths have really reached out to each other and shared those uh, strengths, especially with the quick move to transition to all the technology. So echoing what everyone is seeing, um, it's definitely a kako'o effort. So I would say the same thing as well, Z. Thanks for asking that question and giving one, everyone an opportunity to um, share uh, their lessons learned. Uh, similar to everyone else, I have learned that it's extremely important to be patient and persistent um, through this entire process to really uh, learn from what's happening globally. As Alan said, we are not in this alone. There are so many other campuses across uh, the globe that are facing the same issues we are and there are a lot of lessons to be learned from you know their strengths as well as the challenges that they have uh, faced as well and I think you know we have to remember to be kind and compassionate uh, with one another uh, I, I know right now with Hurricane Douglas knocking on our door there is emergency fatigue uh, we have been in a state of high anxiety for a really long time and we're feeling it and uh, it's important not only to be compassionate and kind to each other but also to be compassionate and kind and patient uh, with oneself. Uh, that uh, we're all we're all in this together, and we all uh, together will um, will make will will do things that are going to be good for our campus, for our families, for our communities. And I guess I want to end with an olelo no iau similar to the one that I started with, and this olelo no iau is um, is one that I, I believe illuminates what everybody had just said and. It's aohe au vaapa pa ika halau ika malie. Basically, that means that no canoes are stuck in the shed when it's calm. It it speaks to the um, the call that everyone, everyone here on this uh, Zoom call and in our campus community, everyone is in it together. We're in our canoes. We are out there working together and moving forward. So. Um, that's my message um, and I'm deeply grateful again to everyone on this call and everyone who has been working on campus uh, to ensure that we we open on August 24th in, in a good way, uh, in a welcoming way, um, in a, to uh, welcome everybody back to a wonderful, vibrant academic year that's safe and health and healthy.
Thank you, Chancellor. Um, before I forget, we mentioned a hotline earlier. That number is 689-2525. So thank you again, everyone, for joining our Q&A today. Um, for more information, you can visit our website at westoahu.hawaii.edu slash COVID-19. Thank you and take care.